so what I want to talk about in general is like nonverbal communication. So really you can do that with any set of puzzles in this game, um, but uh, it, it's kind of just a question of what you want to do. Um, but one of my favorite sequences in the game actually is this sequence, uh, which is the um, orchard sequence. So we're going to go up here and do these puzzles and we're going to talk about it. So, I don't know if there's tearing on the video, but there's definitely tearing when I'm looking at it. Uh, but we won't worry about it, it should be fine. Okay, so, uh, more or less the way the orchard works is like, if you as a player were coming up here, you'd just be coming into this beautiful orchard with all these lovely, um, I suppose they're cherry trees, because the, uh, it's the only tree that I've ever seen that has these kind of pink blossoms. Um, and so far you've played the game enough to where you see You've seen a few of these panels, and you know generally like that's what you can interact with, right? So we know when we get to this panel that we're going to do something with it. Um, and in this case, we don't really necessarily know what we want to do, but we might notice that this panel look, happens to look kind of like a tree, right? Um, and when we come to this first panel, uh, it is it happens to take us into this view here. Um, where you can sort of, apologies for my uh, fridge, it, it makes this noise periodically, it's kind of, it's an old fridge, so when the compressor shuts off it makes that noise, anyway, so apologies about that noise. Anyway, um, so when we look at this panel, uh, there is a tree to the left hand side of the screen there, uh, you'll notice, um, that you might notice, right? You might think about that, and you might think, hmm, okay, well, I guess maybe this maps to that, right? So you might think that, and maybe you'll go look at it a little more. Um, and in case that you do, you'd notice that, oh, actually, like, there's a branch broken off here, right? And so that makes sense, too, because although I think the game makes an attempt to make it clear that you wouldn't look at the tree from this side, it's sort of ambiguous from the panel without having the tree be a little asymmetrical. So that's why on the panel it's asymmetrical and also in reality, I guess you would say, uh, it's asymmetrical. The real tree is asymmetrical and this um, um, symbolic representation of the tree is also asymmetrical. So we do know that, okay, this right side here is also the right side of the tree. And we know that, okay, well, we can just kind of follow the branches. So if we go up, um, then it branches once we know to the right, um, and then it branches to the left, and then it branches to the right again, and then it appears to also branch to the right, and there's an apple there. And, of course, that is the correct answer. And as we've seen before in the game, when you light up a panel, uh, one of these uh, little cables tends to stick out of the panel and also light up. Um, it's this lovely pink line here, um, and we can sort of follow this cable, but it's kind of hard to follow through the grass. We see a little bit of it over here as it crosses this wall, and then it heads over here to another panel. And then this panel, because, okay, so this is a thing that I want to talk about, um, is, like I said, nonverbal communication through games, but it's not just about communication. Right, it's communication in the sense that like writing a novel is communication. So you're not, the only thing that you're doing is not necessarily communicating. Um, like that's not all that you're doing. You're trying to, like it's a, it, you've opened a line of communication with the player um, in the same way that if the, uh, you know, if a reader opens a book and they're reading words on a page, that's a line of communication. Um, but you have an opportunity to play with that and create, I guess what you could call drama or humor or comedy or whatever. You have an opportunity to do those things uh, in the same way that you might in a book or a play or a film or anything else. But here you're doing it entirely through gameplay, um, which is very clear because it's nonverbal, right? So with that said, uh, let's go back to this particular puzzle. So we're looking at this puzzle panel, and unlike before, where if you remember there was a tree off to the left, which we could see while we were working on the panel, now we can't really see anything uh, that would indicate to us what we should do. 
Um, and not only that, but this panel looks, by all indications, to be the exact same panel as this previous one. So there's lots of possibilities here. We don't know. Um, maybe if we're not paying that much attention, we might think, well, maybe we'll copy this solution from the previous panel, right? Let's see whether that works. <laughs> and of course, that doesn't work, and it shuts down the panel. So now we have to go back and resolve this one in order to get that to light up again. So the actual thing that you need to do, which is sort of obvious, right? Because you're, you're, you're in this orchard, there's pink trees, and the only relevant one here is the one that's not pink. It's this green tree that has a red apple. And if you head over here, you'll notice there's, oh, there's a green tree with a red apple here. And it's like, okay, well, I probably don't look at it from this side because I can't really see much. So maybe I look at it from this side. You might think that, like, the fact that there's these little bushes here implies and makes it difficult to see what's going on implies that probably I should look at it from this side. But again, if you've been somewhat astute, you'll notice that there's this broken branch and the broken branch is in the same position here. So if the, if the broken branch is on the right or the missing branch is on the right on the panel, uh, then probably we wanna look at the tree from the side where the missing branch would be on the right. So this one requires us to remember where the actual uh, apple is, right? Which is right here. Um, and then go draw that on the panel. So we have to think, okay, well, let's see, we go up, then we go left, then we go right, then we go right, and then we go left. So up, left, right, right, left. So we go up, left, right, right, left. And of course that works because that's, you know, what we've learned from the previous panel is, okay, we draw a line to the apple. It's just this one's a little bit of a variation on that. So again, as I said earlier, we want to talk about this line of communication to the player, which is like where you do variations on something, right? In this case, that variation is, oh, I can't see the tree while I'm working on the panel. I have to actually look at it and then remember what it is and then draw it, which is just a basic variation, right? So of course, now the wire is actually fairly easy to follow. There's no grass right here. It goes over a little wall, and it goes up to a panel again, which is good because it's somewhat far away from those previous two panels, right? And maybe you could say that implies some conceptual distance between the two panels as well. Um, now we look at this and we notice, well, now the broken branch is on the left, right? And when we're looking at this, we can see the tree again. It's over here uh, on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, so it's in perfect view, but it doesn't really seem like it lines up with this tree, right, on the panel. The, the real tree doesn't really look like this, so I'm not sure what we do. Um, maybe we go like this to the right, and that's on the right, so we try that. Okay, and that worked, right? So we're kind of looking at this tree that's sort of tangled, and that seems to work. Um, now, of course, you can look at, you know, you can look at the tree from many different angles. Um, but again, we had a broken branch, right? So I was sort of doing this, assuming that looking at it this way was the right way. But if you needed to figure that out, you could find this broken branch here and, uh, and see that it was that in fact is the correct way to look at the tree. Um, so again, it's a variation because now this tree, the branches, there's no way to really look at the tree that the branches don't kind of twist with each other. And so you need to start looking at this panel as more of an abstract representation of the tree rather than a literal representation of the tree in the sense that we're thinking about the branches, right? Because you could be just thinking about it in terms of this is an angle of looking at the tree. Instead, it's like, well, we're thinking about it in terms of an abstract tree, right? Where it it branches, like it goes up, and then it goes to the left, and then it branches to the right, and then it branches to the right again, and then it branches to the right again. So it's like left, right, 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 right. So we think about those branches, um, the splits, where the tree splits, and then that's sort of what, what we're thinking about here. Now, there's another wire here. 
If it runs over, we can follow it around here, around this tree, up over this wall. We just kind of follow the wire. Oh, we can't quite go that way. And then it goes up and around and into this little courtyard area here. And then we approach this panel, which we see from the back side. And again, this is similar to the last one, right? Um, in that we can see the tree, but it doesn't necessarily appear to line up. In fact, if we look at it this way, um, there's not a broken branch here, right? So that totally doesn't line up. So how are we supposed to figure out like where this is? In fact, the, from this viewpoint, the, uh, the apple is almost totally obscured by branches of the tree. So it's like, okay, well, this is kind of like the other one in the sense that, um, I should say, it's kind of like the second puzzle in the sequence, right? Only now we're taking one where the branches are sort of twisted like this, um, and we're making it to where you can't do it just by, just by looking at the tree. So we need to think, okay, well, let's find a good angle to look at the tree. It's like, okay, here's a decent angle. I can see most of the branches. And I can see that we would go, well, let's look at, okay. So let's say this. We would go up and left and right and right and left. So we'll go up and left and right and right and left. Well, that's wrong. Like, that didn't work. Um, all right, so let's go back to the last panel and try it again. Now, again, the, you could argue the, the, the issue of having to go back to these previous panels is kind of oh, not that great, especially when that happens, right? And it's a cascading thing. Uh, but I suppose the idea is to prevent you from brute forcing, right? But most of the time, with the simpler panels like this, you can just sort of see. But even when you look at this, right? There's a possibility you could think this apple is on that left branch and it's actually the right one. So it's it's still somewhat tricky to do it from that angle, but um, not impossible to just do it from where you're looking at it. Okay, so again, we get to this. And the, the point that I was wanting to make is by looking at it from this angle, uh, we solved this panel this way, right? which seemed like it would be right, but it wasn't right, so we know that we need to try something else. And the important thing to realize here is that you can look at the tree from two angles. We've never used that before, but now we have to because this branch is on the left side here, and it's on the left side on this panel, this broken branch, I should say. So we need to think about looking at this tree from this side, which is not necessarily easy. It's not the easiest way to look at it, but we do know, okay, that's on the right main branch. So we go right, up, left, right. So it's right, left, right. So we go right, left, right. Is that it? Let's see. Right, left, right, right, yes. Right, left, right, right. Right, left, right, right. Oh, no, that's not right. Okay. Right, left, no, wait, right, up, left, right, left, right. Hmm. That's interesting. Right, left, left, right. Oh, okay. See, you have to think about every little branch. Right, left, left, right. Okay. But yeah. The, the, the going back to the previous panels in some sense may be a moot point, but it does discourage brute forcing, um, and maybe that's good enough. Anyway, so what was it again? Let's see, it was right, left, left, right. So we need to think about the branches again. Right, left, left, right. So it's actually this branch, not the right one, even though from this angle it kind of looks straight, right? So you might not notice this branch because it seems like it's going straight and then right, but it is actually going left and then right. Anyway. So again, it's really just in this sense that's escalating, right? Like there's there's two ways that you can kind of build out puzzles, which is you introduce this rule. This rule here has been 
you draw a line to the apple, wherever the apple is on the tree, you gotta draw a line, and we can, of course, increase complexity by making the tree more twisted or whatever, right? And so that's sort of what this is doing, is like twisting the branches to where you can't necessarily just look at it, and then you have to look at it from a specific angle, which you've never had to look at it from, which is an awkward angle. Like every other one you've had to look at from the easy angle, right? And now it's like, no, you have to look at this one from the awkward angle. And then we get to um, what I want to call, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I'll end up calling it, but it's like, it's the prestige, right? It's the act three. It's the final thing that you do to cap off this kind of sequence, right? Because you want to, you want to end each sequence. If you're going to do a sequence of puzzles, you want to end it with like a test, right? You want to end it with a puzzle that's good, that feels really good, that feels different, that feels like it introduces some new wrinkle in this. And there are, the first aspect of this is that it will seem as though, based on the previous understanding of the rules, that it is impossible. So we go here, and it's like, well, okay, panel, it's got two broken branches, three broken branches, that's fine, right? All we have to do is match up the broken branches, and then we have to draw the line to the apple. That's all. That's what we've done before. We've done that a bunch of times. This one's just appears to be an increased complexity. Well, there's more broken branches, and then I guess we find the apple. And so we go over here, and it's like, wait a second. There's no apple on this tree, so what am I supposed to do, right? Like, this appears to be impossible according to the rules that we know of. Um, so there's no apple. All right. Well, the only thing that we know how to do otherwise, I guess, is match up the broken branches. So we're looking for three broken branches, and there are one, two, three, four broken branches. Okay, there's four broken branches. So there's no apple, and the broken branches don't appear to match up, at least based on preliminary analysis because there's more broken branches than the, on the tree than there are on the panel. So what the hell are we supposed to do? So this makes this a quote unquote real puzzle, right? Because it requires you to take, you, you can't think in a A, B straight line where everything that's come before informs us on how to do this puzzle. Instead, you need to think laterally in this case what you need to do is just continue to try to match it up and see, okay, well, we're looking, I guess, for the leftmost branch. Let's see, left, left, right, left. Okay, so we're looking for left, left, right, and then a broken branch. So how does that look? Uh, left, left right and then the broken branch is on the left here no that's not what it is so maybe it's this left let's see up left left hold on is that a broken branch no that's not a broken branch so it must be this right so it must be left left right left hmm, that's interesting left, left, right, left. Well, that's on the far left though, right? Hmm, hmm, hmm. So it's, 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 you know, part of this is that it makes it a very tricky puzzle, right? Because it's difficult to even to match up anything with this tree and say, okay, it feels like a different tree, right? It feels like it doesn't match up with the panel. So, um, at least looking at it from this way, it feels like, let's see, up left, left, right, right. Well, that one's broken off there, right? So that fits there, so maybe this is the right angle to look at it. So let's go up, right, right. Okay, that's missing a branch there too, so that feels the right way to look at it. 
and up here that's not missing a branch so that's a little weird and then over here it's missing a branch right here it's hard to see but it is missing a branch right there so that feels like the right way to look at it so really then it kind of becomes a thing of maybe we will uh, like solve this by the discrepancy here right it's like hmm okay so it's up right left right left up right left right left and of course that's the solution right because we've realized there's a discrepancy between the panel and the tree and it's really only one discrepancy so maybe that's the line right so it requires you to make this leap which is to say this puzzle requires you to solve it using something that is not exactly what came before now here's the other thing that i want to point out is there is a this is only one part of doing this because at this point this is fine you've done something that's tricky and you you know you've been cool because you broke the rules or whatever but no you've not broken the rules and it's very important for this type of puzzle game design you cannot break the rules you can have something that looks like you broke the rules and this certainly looks like it I mean every single puzzle has taught me this rule that I'm drawing a line to an apple and now I'm drawing a line to a fucking missing branch what the fuck is going on but no they haven't broken the rule and that evidence is right over here here is a broken branch and an apple that has been cut up this is the branch which came off of that tree there was an apple on that branch so we still drew to the branch that there was an apple but because we took this twist which is saying there's something you don't know which is this apple and this branch that had the apple on it has been broken off now you need to solve for it but we always had to draw for the branch where the apple was which means on the panel there has to be a branch where the apple was um, but on the tree there does not necessarily have to be a branch where the apple was and that's what we're exploring with this puzzle so that's this whole sequence and uh, of course you could argue about whether or not this is you know there's lots of sequences of puzzles in the game you could argue about whether or not this is your favorite one or whatever but this is one of my favorites and it's one of my favorites just for the fact that it has this it has a subtle aspect to it right where um, it requires you to be observant uh, after you solve the final puzzle because of course a lot of people could just kind of bang their head against this and then they finally solve the puzzle and it's like oh that's great okay whatever moving along oh it opened this gate this is cool I can look at some art over here or whatever but the only reason that this opens up this area here is for you to see this right and I also want to point out something here about this is that the conventional wisdom of if you were saying the game like you're designing a game to communicate things through the to the player the conventional wisdom would be to say that well I should tell the player what's going on up front right and then ask them to solve a puzzle but if you told the player what was going on if you gave them this here first and you said well the branch is broken and the branch that's broken had an apple on it that defeats the whole scenario there and it is much less interesting right so again to what i said earlier about communication through gameplay that is not necessarily communicating in the most straightforward sense and more in the creative writing or novel type sense right where you're trying to communicate something in an interesting way uh, or a dynamic way or a dramatic way um, sometimes that involves withholding some amount of information uh, for the benefit of the player in this sense right or the reader in the case of a book like you might have a plot twist and essentially this is the video game version of a plot twist oh plot twist that was broken off right and even still this was part of it right this is part of 
this is part one of the plot twist, which is where you show somebody something that's like, what is going on? And then part two is where you, you know, it's explained, right? All right. So, this is a game called Steven's Sausage Roll. Um, if you haven't played it, you should probably check it out because it's a very well designed puzzle game. Um, you may not love it, but uh, because it's very difficult, you might bounce off of it. But it is very well designed. So I want to take a look at a level from this game. So the first thing I want to say about Steven Sausage Roll is, much like The Witness, it doesn't really explain anything. It doesn't really explain anything to you to begin with, right? Um, it just sort of leaves it up to you to figure out, um, and that means there's a lot of things that you have to figure out. Um, but even just wandering around, it's sort of like, okay, well, what am I going to do? Okay, like if I just walk straight, then I can see this thing gives me the instructions. Um, but you know, we quickly notice, well, if I hit left and like the controls are kind of weird because like if I hit left here, then it turns me, and then if I hit left, then I step. If I hit right, I step backwards, that's kind of weird, it doesn't turn me. So it's like if I hit an adjacent direction to where I am, then it turns me, but if I hit the opposite or the direct direction that I'm going, I move forwards or backwards, so it's kind of weird. I can't move sideways, it seems like, so it's just weird. So there's a lot of, a lot of weirdnesses just at the basic movement and even getting to one of these uh, puzzles that I might want to try is a little tricky, right? C finger. So, you know, as with every puzzle in this game, the idea is that we want to cook these sausages. Um, we want to cook them on both sides, um, and each side has two tiles that we need to cook, and we don't want to cook, we don't want to overcook, so we don't want to double cook each side. So here the problem is like what we might normally do is like this, and it's like, oh, well that knocked it in there. So really the only thing we can do here is this to push it. And so that teaches us that we can do this maneuver, right? But if we do that, then we push it in. So we can't do that. Instead, we at this point need to do something else. It's like, well, what can we do? We can't do that because that pushes it in. So maybe we'll try this. And then we'll try pushing it up. Oh no, that burned it. Maybe we'll try doing this. That seems fine. Well, what can we do now? Oh, can't do anything. Okay, well. So by the nature of the design of the game, it's such that there's only so much we can do, right? Even if we do this, it's like, okay, that pushes us in. Um, what can we do? So we know, you know, by the design of the game. Like, this is part of why this game is well designed is unlike a lot of Sokemon games, which is this type of game where you're pushing blocks around and stuff, um, this game very much constrains what you can do. Uh, which is generally, in some cases, is good game design. I, was, I would argue in this case it's good game design. In other cases, you could see it as hand-holding, but it's like, it's done in this way that's not... Here, you, did you realize that you can stick your fork off the edge of a platform and turn to push the, you know, it's like it's not telling you that. It's, but it is telling you that in an implicit way because it puts you in a situation where literally the only thing you can do that doesn't fuck you over is that. So it teaches you this kind of interesting maneuver. And then at this point, you know, we've tried this and then we know that, okay, by experimentation, uh, there's nothing really that we can do that gets us in a good situation because that other sausage is not moved so it must be that we have to do something when we're in this situation um, so we can step back and realize okay well what was the point at which I made a decision earlier um, because there ha I had you know there's not really a whole lot of decisions that I'm making and I kind of can explore this relatively small tree of possibilities right to figure out what I can do. So in this case, it's like, oh, okay, so I can do that, and I can push this up here, and then I can do this, and then at that point, 
trivial, right? We've solved it. That's all there was to the puzzle was we needed to explore this very small branch and then at a certain point it would become very, very evident how we solved the puzzle. And that is part of why this game is designed so well is because every single puzzle in the game, at least as far as I've gotten, I haven't completed the game, but every single puzzle so far has been part of a stream of communication between the game and the player in which you are gradually building up these kind of building blocks of understanding about how you move in the game, uh, what types of things you can do to move these sausages around, what types of things you can't do, uh, what situations are, are advantageous, disadvantageous, what are the situations where you're stuck without you even having to like try a bunch of stuff. You already know, oh shit, I'm stuck here because like the nature of you know the way that I can move means that I'm stuck. Um, and the game builds on that, and so it's like, well, now I know you know this, so I can put you in a situation that expects you to know that uh, in order to make this easier, right? Um, but it's exploring all these nooks and crannies. I don't know. Um, maybe this is not the best game for me to look at just because I have not necessarily explored all like the possibilities of this game, uh, but still. Um, maybe we'll come back to this game. But it's a well-designed puzzle game, and so it's probably worth mentioning in terms of nonverbal communication. All right, so I wanted to look at a little bit of level design in Dark Souls 3. I think maybe the audio is louder in this game. Anyway, so I wanted to look at a little bit of level design in Dark Souls 3. Um, just to show an example of like a non-puzzle game and how things get communicated in that, like in a different genre, like an action game. Okay, so uh, of course this is a bonfire that's in a area that's fairly near to the start of the game. Um, again, apologies for if I am playing in a shitty way. I am not used to playing this game with a mouse and keyboard, so that's a little bit of a different thing to do. I'm definitely much more used to playing this game with a controller. Um, anyway, so I want to talk about level design. Um, and so, of course, you enter this area from over here, right? This door. And so you're coming in here. So there's a few different ways you can go. You can go to the right, you can go to the left. Um, the area where there's a bonfire is over to the right. Oftentimes things in, in this uh, game are particularly hidden, right? So it is space to jump. All right. Okay. Cl uh, middle click. Because I've never played this really with uh, a mouse. Some of the things seem kind of intuitive, but some of the things not so much. Anyway. So really, what I want to talk about is this area. Okay. So uh, in this particular area, uh, there's of course what is a common thing in Souls games, which is an ambush. Uh, in Souls games, almost always when you come to an area like this, where it is a fairly open area, with something that's kind of interesting to look at, uh, usually there will be an ambush, uh, which means that there will be some monsters that show up. Um, and in this particular case, there's a double ambush, uh, where a monster comes up from this ladder, which will distract you from a monster that is coming up from over here. There's also two guys here you can kill if you feel like it. And uh, uh, we come to this down here. Um, now there are a bunch of, I don't know what you call it, undead, I guess. There's a bunch of these undead guys that are up on this uh, building rooftop over here. And if you have not played this area, then you'll probably run out here and just kind of not think about it too much. And then there's this guy who stands up and you're like, okay, come on over here, buddy. I can handle you. At which point he does this. 
and kills most of his buddies and becomes a way more formidable opponent than he normally would be. I'm probably going to die. Okay, I died. So anyway, it's a that's sort of, you know, um, it's a joke, right? It's a joke at the expense of the player uh, to have this really, um, what you normally think of as cannon fodder type enemy. Because there's a bunch of those enemies there that you just kind of kill in one hit. They're even easier than these guys. Uh, and yet it turns into this super powerful thing that can kill you very easily. Anywho. So, here we are again. So we know last time what we want to do is we want to run out here and get this guy before he transforms. So that's what you're trying to do, right? Is if you get out here and you kill him before he transforms, then it's no big deal. Just a bunch of cannon fodder enemies. Fairly easy to proceed. So, um, so let's talk a little bit more about the level design, right? Which is there's these guys on the left, so we're likely to proceed over to the left. Um, at which point we kind of hit a dead end because there's a wall here, there's a wall here, there's not much we can do, so I guess we'll head over this way. Now, at this point we've reached an area where um, we get to this sort of precipice here and you're not entirely sure what's down there, so you're likely to look down and head down here, at which point you're also likely to see that fire down there which makes that a point of interest down in this area and is also will make it more likely that you'll look down and see this uh, guy, this mini boss, walking around here. And so you'll think, oh, okay, I guess I'm probably supposed to get down there. So, of course, um, in typical Dark Souls-style level design fashion, um, it's not exactly clear how you get down there. And it's instead required that you sort of pay close attention to the environment, in which case you will see that there's a ladder here. Um, it happens to be next to a lantern, which makes it somewhat easier to find. But still, uh, it's a little bit tricky to find. Now, if you pop down here and you just sort of hang around for a bit, you're liable to get hit by this guy over here, who will lead you over here, where you will find two guys, both with fire arrows and another ambush. Now this ambush is particularly nasty because if you don't take those guys out very quickly, you'll be being hit by this guy who has a has fire crossbow bolts um, the whole time. Now, the game has led you over here by virtue of there simply being enemies over here that you might want to dispatch. And although there is other stuff up here, in fact there's a whole whole area down this way that you might go to. This is actually where you need to go. Um, and again, you need to be a little bit paying attention. We've gone down two ladders so far, so we need to go down another ladder. And there's this is the ladder that you quote unquote need to go to. Um, it will get you down to that area where you can progress further. Now, we've reached a point here, it's sort of a plateau. There's a bunch of like uh, dead guys here and in typical like, if you've played enough Dark Souls, then you get to this point and you know, well, I should probably be cautious because there's a bunch of dead stuff here, but possibly one of these is alive. Now, if you really are an expert at Dark Souls, you'll notice that that guy over there um, with the light coming out of him is probably the one that's alive because there doesn't appear to be an actual real reason for that light, and enemies emit light when they're alive. So, of course, that's the guy that comes to life. But, again, in typical Dark Souls fashion, we also get ambushed, right? So we're, we're never allowed to let our guard down. But this guy over here, who is sort of the formidable looking dude, is actually dead. Um, you know, he's pierced by a bunch of things, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Those other guys were, are pierced by things, and sometimes they're alive in other games. Okay. So now we get down here to uh, the sort of mini-boss area. And uh, 
Again, I've played a decent amount of Dark Souls, so I know I can kind of probably just walk around this guy and it's no big deal. He won't aggro me, and I'd be likely to probably go down this way, where I'll run into this guy. There was a guy down here who will hurt me, um, and maybe I want to get out of here. I don't know. Uh, I think I'll hide from this guy. Let's stay in this corner. That seems safe. Stay as far away from him as possible. Okay, maybe he won't see me. Okay, good. He didn't see me. So I'll sort of hang out here for a bit, right? And it's like, well, we feel pretty good about things. Everything's safe. No big deal. And uh, we can head on our way. So um, a lot of times that's sort of... I guess what you would say is like higher level Dark Souls play is being able to avoid enemies like that. And even coming out here, um, if you notice, if I would have popped out there, there's a guy over here on the right who will shoot fire arrows at me from right there and ambush me. And even if I'm paying attention to him, if I let my guard down after I kill him, there's another guy who comes from over this way uh, who will ambush me by that point. So I'm likely to come out here be hit by a fire arrow from the right, and then head over to the guy on the right, and then be hit from the left. And if I proceed up here, eventually I'll find my way to an area which I've been to earlier. Now that's probably just a really random way to look at the level design, but I kind of wanted to talk just about how the game is directing your attention as you go along, right? So it's directing your attention over here, and if we go up here, we'll find they loop back to an earlier area which establishes a shortcut to where you can come down here without doing all that. Okay, so we've looked at two puzzle games and we've also looked at a non-puzzle game and we've talked about how games can communicate things or establish a line of communication to the player non-verbally and use that to kind of do things that are sort of not what you traditionally consider a game to be doing, um, like being humorous uh, just through nature of gameplay scenarios or puzzle scenarios um, and kind of create drama and different types of um, different types of you know ways in which the game might flow uh, just by virtue of the design of the levels and the design of the um, mechanics I suppose but um, I guess now the point in this talk that I'd be reaching is the point where I would talk about how you do that type of design right uh, which is a bit of a wishy-washy topic for me. I don't have a great um, like list of here's how you do it type things. Um, it's more about being opportunistic and keeping an open mind when you're designing things so that when the opportunities come along for you to do uh, this type of design um, that you pursue those opportunities, right? It's primarily going to be about that um, mindfulness, I suppose, in the meditative sense, right? So being aware of what you are doing, being aware of why you're doing it, and being aware of when you might be getting stuck in a rut. When you find yourself stuck in a rut, uh, tending to turn to uh, a lateral thinking type situation where you do something that is outside of what's been established in the game and um, you want to iterate on the design of the game as much as possible and for as long as possible. Um, you never want to lock things down before you have to because the longer you can iterate on something and the more opportunity that you have to improve the thing um, in general, the better it will be. But that does have limits. Um, you can push things too far, of course. Um, if you continue to iterate at a certain point, you're kind of getting diminishing returns, like every new version that you do of a thing is not quite as good. So you need to keep an eye out for when things reach the point where um, you're iterating on them, but they're not really better than they used to be. They're just different, right, than they used to be. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's again, it's part of that mindfulness, right? Don't be afraid to use your intuition uh, when it comes to making things in the game better because a lot of times you're going to reach a point with a design idea or something where there's no like logically best approach uh, to a particular 
a particular design problem. And then it's going to be more guided by feel, right? It's going to be more guided by what you feel is the best thing, um, at least for you personally. So yeah, I don't know. It's, that's Like I said, it's very wishy-washy. Um, I'll try to figure that stuff out um, before I do the quote-unquote real talk. But uh, this sort of made an interesting video, hopefully for anybody that watched this. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I'd like to thank you for <laughs> suffering through this or whatever. Um, hopefully you found it interesting, um, even if it was not what I might call um, one of my most eloquent presentations of ideas or the most clear thing in terms of how you might do something. But I'm trying to show some examples of what I consider to be good game design or level design um, and how, you know, a, a little bit of an idea of how you might approach that. So, um, again, I'd like to thank you for watching, um, and uh, I'll see you all around on the internet. Bye.